Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Neil Evans. Uh, Neil Evans uh, is one of the most prominent figures in, in, the, in the observational study of star formation. He's the Edward uh, Randall Jr. Centennial Professor in Astronomy at the University of Texas. And he, uh, like I said, he has been leading uh, observational studies of molecular clouds and star formation for, for decades, literally. Uh, he obtained uh, both his undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of California at Berkeley, and he has led or, and participated in several key surveys, including uh, the Spitzer, Spitzer's Legacy Project's C2D, Course to Discs, and the Google Build uh, Project. He also has written a couple of uh, very important uh, reviews for uh, annual reviews of astronomy and astrophysics, uh, the second one with Rob Kennicott. And together with uh, Ben Zuckerman, he has been one of the leading uh, promoters of the understanding that star formation is a slow process, which he's going to talk to us about uh, today. But before, before uh, giving the word to Neil, I would like to mention that in, on a more personal note that he was my professor in, in Austin. I don't want to think, and probably he doesn't want to either, uh, how many decades ago that was. but. Uh, 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 it was a very interesting course called uh, Quantum Mechanics in Astrophysics, but I was also his teaching assistant in the Search for Extraterrestrial Life uh, course for undergraduates, and that was a fantastic course from which I learned a lot. So uh, he's also uh, a, a great teacher, and that's, uh, that's something we all of his students are very uh, fond of. And uh, so today he's going to talk to us precisely about the, the central problem of star formation. Why is it so slow? Neil. Thank you, Enrique. Uh, yeah, it was a long time ago that we, uh, you were a student here. Uh, okay, so why do we call it the central problem of star formation? The, the key point is that it's slower than expected, as Enrique said. Let's, let's see what we might expect. Uh, the Milky Way has about a billion, one times 10 to the ninth solar masses of molecular gas. Uh, we typically assume that molecular clouds have an average density of 100 particles per cubic centimeter. Uh, if you plug that into the equation for freefall time, you'll get about 3.3 million years. So very simply divide the mass by the freefall time and you get a star formation rate predicted from this simple consideration of about 300 solar masses per year. Now, in contrast, the actual star formation rate kind of averaged over the last giga year or so using lots of different methods uh, is about 1.9 plus or minus 0.4 solar masses per year. This is a, from a paper by Chomik and Povich, which used lots of different techniques and kind of came up with a consensus value. So you can see that there's about a factor of 160 issue. Uh, even for astronomy, that's, uh, that's pretty bad. Uh, another way to look at it is the depletion time, how long it would take all of the mass of molecular clouds to turn into stars is about half a million years. Uh, sorry, 500 million years, uh, about half a giga year. Uh, and that's much longer than the, the lifetimes we think for, uh, for molecular clouds. So uh, th this basic problem was set forth, uh, as Enrique mentioned, in a couple of papers by Ben Zuckerman. I was involved in one of those. I started as a grad student, and when it, by the time it was published, I was a postdoc. So we're talking about almost 50 years ago, this problem's been around. So it's, it's the oldest problem of star formation. And I, I would argue it's the most embarrassing problem. How, how can we be off by a factor of 160? So the, the, there's another angle that, that, that sometimes is referred to as, as low efficiency, but it's really the slowness of star formation. But it's also less efficient if we, if we uh, use epsilon to indicate that, you know, the mass of stars divided by the mass of the stars plus the mass of the cloud. So what, what fraction of the original cloud mass turns into stars? Um, we can think about this in the following way. We can't, we can't measure that because we can't watch the whole process from start to finish as observers. You can do it as theorists, but not as observers. So, but if we look at the distribution of cloud masses, they uh, it, it expressed in, in the form I wrote it there, they're a power law with a slope of uh, minus 0.6 and an upper mass cutoff, it's, it's people argue a bit, but it's maybe 6 million solar masses. 
if you look at the distribution of young cluster masses, and I don't mean globular clusters, I mean relatively recently formed clusters, uh, their distribution is steeper and has an upper mass cutoff that's two orders of magnitude smaller. Uh, this is based on data from the references shown there. Well, that suggests that the efficiency at the high end is about 1% just by taking the upper limit of the cluster mass over the uh, upper limit of the cloud mass. So the final result seems to be inefficient as well as slow. Now, this is not just a problem of the Milky Way. This is a, a figure from the uh, uh, annual review article that uh, Enrique mentioned with Rob Kennicott, and you can talk about the Kennicott Schmidt relationship a lot. There, the only thing I contributed to this figure was the point labeled MW for Milky Way. And you can see the Milky Way is, is pretty typical. This plot shows that the star formation rate surface density scales with the surface density of gas. And, and we could talk about that a lot, but the point I want to make is that if the relevant time scale were 3 million years, the points would be clustered around that red line rather than where they are. And you can see that the discrepancy is orders of magnitude. So this is a problem that, that afflicts not just the Milky Way, but, but essentially all galaxies. So let's, let's uh, re-examine our assumptions. The central problem arises from two basic assumptions. First is that molecular clouds are gravitationally bound. And the other is that star formation happens on a free fall time. So what we did was take the mass of the cloud, assume that it was bound, and divide by the free fall time to get that crazy estimate of 300 solar masses per year. So let's take a close look at this first assumption. Uh, most observers just naturally assume that clouds are, molecular, are, are gravitationally bound. Um, theorists are a little less devoted to this one, and, and we'll see some of that come up as we, as we get to the later parts of the talk. So let's take a look at the actual evidence. First, I wanna just appeal to your common sense. This is the, the most detailed map of uh, the Taurus molecular cloud with many, many pixels. It's color coded because there's three separate velocity components. And <clears throat> we now know that some of these structures are actually at different distances from other structures. So the idea that it's one uniform, even spherical cloud, which many people would like to, to assume is, is, is obviously pretty dubious uh, and uh, you know, play a little game with you, which, which of these kinds of terrestrial clouds does Taurus look more like? But cirrus clouds up in the top there are, are sort of swept or filamentary. Um, they don't produce uh, precipitation. They don't have clear boundaries. Uh, cumulonimbus clouds have nice clear boundaries and, and they do produce precipitation. I think most people's idea about molecular clouds has been that they look sort of like these the clouds on the bottom, whereas I think now that we have good maps, they look more like the clouds on the top, the cirrus clouds. Um, when, when I present my grandson with some fact that he doesn't particularly like, his favorite response is, that's not a thing. Um, and so I want to explore that idea a little bit. The common view is that molecular clouds are well-defined things with clear boundaries, like the cumulonimbus cloud. I want you to think about an alternative view in which molecular observations pick out structures in a continuous interstellar medium flow of mixed atomic and molecular gas. And I'll, I'll go even a little farther afield and, and engage in a little logical uh, philosophy business here. There's something called a reification fallacy. And the part of that that I want to talk about is, is making patterns into things. The most famous case in astronomy uh, was spiral arms. <clears throat> These were thought to be material arms where the material stayed together in the arm. And when Hubble and others came up with large ages for the universe, one of the strongest arguments against those long ages was that the spiral arm should have wound up and you would not have any loose spiral arms. This was only fully resolved when we, with density wave theory in which people understood that these arms were not material objects, but rather patterns. And so I think to some extent, when we talk about molecular clouds, we are making patterns into things. If we go back for a second to this 
picture of clouds, if you look at that group of cirrus structures there, and you imagine that the, the more uh, condensed ones as what you would pick out as clouds, you can see that you, you might identify that as a well-defined cloud, but when you have the bigger picture, you see that it's really just part of an overall flow of material. So I'll depart from this sort of philosophical uh, talk and get into something more serious, but I think it's important that we change the way we conceptualize these things because our current conceptions are causing a lot of problems. So let's, instead of talking about clouds, as best I can, I will talk about structures. And, and the, the question is which molecular structures are bound? So what I mean by a structure is something that's identified by the emission of a particular tracer that picks out something within a continuous medium, the ISM. And when you do that, typically you can measure about three properties, the, the mass, the size, and the line width. And those allow you to evaluate the virial parameter. And I've given a very simple description of the virial parameter there. It's twice the kinetic energy divided by the absolute value of the gravitational energy. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, the kinetic twice the kinetic energy divided by the absolute value of the gravitational energy. And that can be related to the dispersion, sigma v, the size, and the mass according to that equation. And we call it bound if the gravitational energy absolute value is greater than the kinetic energy. So alpha v are less than two. And we'll later on talk about some of the caveats about that, but that's basically what we can measure for big catalogs of clouds, which is what we're gonna do. So let's start with the CO J equals one to zero emission. This is the primary tracer of molecular gas in our galaxy and others. Um, and it's, it's what is used to define clouds. We're gonna think of them as structures, but people make catalogs of clouds based on this emission. The most complete survey of the Milky Way was done by uh, Tom Dame and others in 2001. And recently there have been two catalogs of clouds or structures produced from this survey. In 2016, Rice and collaborators used a dendrogram analysis and then fitting elliptical Gaussians, they, they then broke this emission into a thousand, about a thousand structures, but they only accounted for about 25% of the total mass. In 2017, Miville de Chen did a Gaussian decomposition in velocity and a clustering analysis. He produced, in contrast, 8,000 structures and accounted for all of the mass. So these are two very different uh, catalogs based on the same data. So let's take a look at the fraction that's bound using this criterion of alpha, uh, the virial parameter being less than two. So there's the log of the virial parameter plotted in, in the x-axis and the number in, on the y-axis. And you can see that for the rice catalog, most of the clouds are unbound but a substantial fraction are bound. For the Meville de Chen catalog, on the other hand, you can see that only about a 10th of the clouds are bound. The vast majority are unbound. So the first thing we see is that most clouds are unbound according to either catalog, but the fraction depends on how you analyze the same data. For Meville de Chen, less than 10% of the CO structures are bound. Let's go to the other extreme. Let's, let's look at what are commonly called clumps. These are identified from uh, submillimeter continuum emission and then observations with uh, ammonia in this case, which allows you to get the line width. So the submillimeter continuum can give you the mass and the size, but it can't give you the velocity dispersion. So ammonia was used to get the velocity dispersion. And this was published by a former student of mine named Manuel Morello. Uh, from a high gal survey of the plane with Herschel and using ammonia to get the, the, uh, to get the uh, <clears throat> velocity dispersion and the kinetic temperature, uh, the dust temperature was available from Herschel. So the fraction bound in this case, you can see is uh, very high. Almost all of these clumps are gravitationally bound. Very few are unbound. So this is a totally different picture from what you get when you look at the same regions with CO. 
So uh, is there something in between these two extremes? What about 13 CO? It's less opaque than CO. Maybe it would be something that would be close to telling us whether something's bound or unbound. So the, the Galactic Ring Survey, which was uh, published by Roman Duval et al. in 2010, was in 13 CO, uh, J equals one to zero emission. Uh, it was reanalyzed for the paper I'll tell you about in a bit uh, with the Miville de Chen CO structures. So each of the CO structures was identified with 13 CO emission. And this was done by Mark Heyer, who was involved in the Galactic Ring Survey and Miville de Chen. Uh, I, my, my contribution was to get them to, to agree to do this. And they very, very uh, graciously did. So they compared these two tracers. And so we now know which of these 13 CO structures are identified with which CO structure. And when we analyze uh, the, the 13 CO in the Galactic Ring Survey in the same way as for the, uh, for the CO or the clumps, we find that about a third of these structures are bound. So 13 CO seems to be closer to the, to the midpoint uh, to the thing where it's almost 50-50 whether things are bound or not. Clumps are always bound, CO structures rarely bound, 13 CO structures close to being bound. So I don't know if you, it's an equivalent saying in Spanish, but in English there's a saying, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, which means you know whether something is beautiful or not depends on how you look at it. Uh, and I would modify that here to say that whether something is bound or not depends on how you look at it, what tracer you're using to pick out a structure. So here's the, the fraction of the mass in these various catalogs that is contained in bound structures. And I include several catalogs I haven't talked about because it, it gets too boring to talk about each one. But I plotted them versus the log of the effective density. That's the density of colliders needed to produce a line of about one Kelvin kilometer per second. This is the typical sensitivity of these surveys. So this is the, the minimum density you need to be able to detect in these surveys. So if we imagine that we're measuring the mass based on the, the, the outermost boundaries of what we can see, this is the kind of characteristic density that we, we need. And, and notice that these are far, far less than the, than the critical density. Many people talk about the critical density as what you need to excite a line. That's completely incorrect. Uh, this effect density, these lines are excited at densities far less than the critical density. And this effective density is a, is a better measure of what, you, uh, what, you, what kind of densities you're probing. So you see that the CO1 to zero line, for example, can be excited at densities less than about 30 cubic centimeter. Um, we'll see later a survey of other, other galaxies in CO2 to 1, and, and you'll see that the fraction of uh, mass that's bound is higher for those structures. Uh, the next two points are the 13 CO structures, the GRS, the Galactic Ring Survey we've talked about. I'll talk later about the EXFC, which is an outer galaxy survey. And there's also now nice surveys in 13 CO2 to 1, and you see that gives an even higher value of the fraction of the mass that's bound. And then we get up to the Herschel survey, the clumps that I showed you that used Herschel and ammonia. So the, the fraction of the mass in bound structures increases very steadily with the log of the effective density of the tracer you're using. So this clearly shows that what tracer you use determines uh, whether things that you see are going to be bound or not. So, this is really different from the usual way that uh, astronomers think about these molecular clouds. Typically, they'll use each tracer and measure a different property of the same cloud. Uh, my point of view is that each tracer selects from this complex interstellar medium the structures that satisfy the conditions that you need to see it with your sensitivity and your resolution. So whether you see something or not depends on the distribution of density, temperature, abundance of the tracer. That's what I use X for there. And, and your sensitivity, your resolution. So you're not, you're not seeing a thing, you're picking out a structure in some larger uh, flow. And what we learned is that the higher the density requirements, the more likely the structure is to be bound. So studies of nearby clouds, a lot of it coming out of our, our Spitzer project that Enrique referred to, 
found a very strong concentration of star formation above a surface density of about 120 solar masses per square parsec. For lower surface densities, find very few protostars, very few even uh, pre-stellar cores. Uh, above 120 solar masses, then you begin to see these things in, in some abundance. So that was the kind of a, a criterion we had been using to say that's where stars form in molecular clouds. So it's reasonable to ask whether boundedness correlates with the surface density criterion. And the answer is sort of. Uh, here's the fraction of mass bound structures again versus the log of the surface density. <clears throat> and you can see the red vertical line marks 120 solar masses per square parsec, which kind of is a dividing line between what we call clouds and what we call clumps. And uh, you can see that there's a steady increase with uh, uh, of the fraction of bound mass with surface density, but it's not a, it's by no means a step function. So this 120 solar masses per square parsec criterion was it's useful, but it's not, uh, it, it, it's not a, a strict criterion. And it depends on where you are in the galaxy. So if you remember that plot a few back where, where when I got to the 13 CO, in the plot of uh, fraction of mass versus uh, effective density, there were two points. And there was a point for the galactic ring survey in the inner Milky Way and a point for the uh, outer uh, Milky Way, the EXFC point. And so what we found is in the outer Milky Way, the, the structures are mostly low surface density, but more likely to be bound. In the inner Milky Way, they have higher surface density, but less likely to be bound. So what's happening is that the, the uh, velocity dispersion is quite a bit higher in the inner galaxy and it outweighs the increased surface density in the inner galaxy. So the, the boundedness actually is, is higher in the outer galaxy. This is not something I would have expected. So let's see if this is more general. We, can, we have also the, the CO uh, J equals one to zero survey and, and, uh, with uh, the Neville de Chen analysis. And I'll bring in now uh, this survey of other galaxies in J equals two to one by Sun 2020. Uh, and we'll plot those on the, on the next plot. Oops, the next page. And um, this is versus now galactocentric radius. And you see, again, the fraction of the mass in bound structures. And in the Milky Way, you see a peak in the, at the sort of the galactic center region and then a very low value, actually, very little of the mass is bound, even though that's where a lot of the mass is in the Milky Way, and then an increasing fraction as you go out. You see something rather similar in this, uh, this J, uh, J equals two to one data from Sun. This is data with 150 parsec resolution. We'll talk more about it later. For 70 galaxies, it's an amazing data set. And you see a pretty steady increase in the fraction of, of, of bound mass as you go out away from the center of other galaxies. So we have an interesting thing. Most mass in molecular clouds is in the inner part, but a smaller fraction is bound. So you can imagine this, this might be helpful when we're trying to decrease the star formation rate we predict. So does this explain the slow star formation? Well, it helps, but it's, it's not a complete explanation. And the reason is that the more massive structures are more likely to be bound, and most of the mass is in the more massive structures. I'll show that in the next plot. This is for the Miville de Chen uh, um, catalog of the Milky Way. And that's the virial parameter on the y-axis and the log of the mass of CO on the x-axis. And so in bins of mass, you can see that for low masses, oh, sorry, the, the, the magenta line is the median, the blue line and points are the means and the, the blue error bars are the standard deviations and, the, and, and alpha veer. And, and you can see that the, for most low mass clouds, the, the vast majority of, of structures are, are unbound. It's only when you get up to the really massive structures that you, you find primarily bound structures. So, and, and because of the mass function, a lot, a lot of the mass is up there. So even for Miville de Chen, which had the, the lowest fraction of bound mass, total fraction of bound mass of 0.19, 
we would still project a star formation rate of about 57 solar masses per year. So we've improved from 300, but we're still a long ways above 1.9. Well, we can do a little bit better because that assumed that every cloud in there had a mean density of 100 particles per cubic centimeter in the same free fall time. But we have the mass and the size for each cloud. So we can actually uh, ca calculate the free fall time for each cloud. And so we do that and uh, we let it collapse if and only if the virial parameter is less than two. Well, in that case, we get a predicted star formation rate of 46 solar masses per year. So still a little bit better, uh, but still not, not what we need. So, so far, everything I've said is in this paper uh, written with Mark Har, uh, Miville Deshan and others, um, and just came out about a week ago in, in the app jag. So to go, to do any better, we have to bring in some theory. And so uh, what I'll talk to you about now is work that's in progress. Uh, Eve Ostreicher and uh, jung Gu Kim noticed uh, the paper that I just mentioned and suggested a comparison to their RMHD models. They, so they've calculated our models of star formation when they start with clouds of, of different uh, uh, variable parameter and see what happens. So as a sort of background, theorists have been trying to explain slow star formation with simulations. And the idea is to get the efficiency of star formation per free fall time. And this is called epsilon sub FF for free fall. So it's the efficiency per free fall time, if you like. So up till now, we've just taken the star formation rate to be the mass divided by the free fall time. But now we can introduce this little uh, factor here, which is the efficiency per free fall time. And, and what people have found over the years is it's very hard to get the free fall efficiency low enough if the, you start off with bound clouds. Um, so people have recently begun to simulate the behavior of clouds with initial conditions that have virial parameters greater than two, that is unbound, initially unbound clouds. And they find that the, um, the efficiency per free fall time depends on this virial parameter. So uh, Padawan and all, for example, fit their uh, simulations to something like this formula that the free fall efficiency depends exponent decreases exponentially with the square root of the initial virial parameter. So unlike observers, theorists have the advantage of being able to follow their, their evolution. So they start, they know what the initial virial parameter, how they set up the calculation and uh, they, can, they can find this relationship. So uh, Kim et al working with, with uh, Eve Ostreicher fit a series of simulations also with, uh, with a <clears throat> free fall efficiency, which depends uh, in the way that it's shown here. So it's always the square root of the virial parameter but that factor out front, what was just called B for Padawan, uh, is what matters. And that differs from, from uh, one theorist to another. So uh, Kim et al. did not resolve the core to star process. So they got basically their sink particles were, were essentially protostellar cores. So we multiply by an additional efficiency, which is the efficiency of material going from a core into a star. And we take that to be about 0.3. That's, that's based on the fact that outflows disturb, just push away a lot of the material uh, and about a third of the material is thought to get into the star that's in the, the, the collapsing core. So that leaves us with a formula at the bottom where the free fall efficiency is equal to the core to star efficiency times this efficiency that depends on the variable parameter. So just to, to put this in a graphical form, Here's, here's three ideas about this efficiency for free fall time. The uh, version in blue is my simple-minded observer point of view in which I just say, well, if it's unbound, it doesn't make any stars. And if it's bound, it makes stars with unit efficiency. So that's that blue step function. That's, that's clearly too simplistic. Um, Padawan and Kim are the, the, the uh, green and uh, orange plots. And you can see that 
this produces a, a, an efficiency which is much lower, even if the cloud is, is quite bound, but very low efficiency if the cloud is unbound. But it gives us something which is we can parameterize uh, and we can predict then cloud by cloud in these catalogs what would be the star formation rate. Now, before I show you the result of that, I have to talk about another aspect, um, and that's the conversion from observations of CO to mass of molecular gas. Uh, we're talking about surveys of the entire Milky Way galaxy. And um, an interesting and peculiar feature is that uh, people who study the Milky Way have tended to assume a constant conversion from the luminosity of CO to the mass of CO. Uh, that is captured in uh, the, the parameter alpha CO. I'm sorry that it's another alpha, but it's standard notation, but I use, I'll always try to have the subscript CO there. So this alpha CO, based on studies of nearby clouds and lots of lots of simulations and so forth and so on, is thought to be about 4.3 solar masses per K kilometers per second parsec squared. So that's kind of the observational luminosity unit for radio astronomers and we want to convert that into solar masses. So that's the assumption that's been used primarily for Milky Way studies. On the other hand, extragalactic studies assume that this conversion factor is a function of metallicity, and they have good reason to do so. They, there's observations that indicate that. Uh, and in particular, the Sun 2020 paper that I mentioned before, and then we'll see more of later, uh, used a formula that the, the, the uh, alpha of CO as a function of Z is 4.35 times Z to the minus A, where A is taken to be 1.6. Now, the definition of metallicity here is that Z equals one for quote unquote solar. We don't mean the sun, we mean the solar neighborhood, the interstellar gas in the solar neighborhood. Okay, so if we're gonna, compare the Milky Way and other galaxies, we really ought to try to do something that's more consistent with what the extragalactic astronomers are doing. Turns out not to be so easy. Um, Gong et al. Uh, in 2020 simulated the CO emission from model clouds and fitted functions. So how they, they had simulated clouds, they modeled the CO excitation and emission and had formulas for how much CO emission you get uh, for a given uh, a column density of molecular gas. Uh, we converted those to this alpha parameter as a function of Z. Oh, I should say Gong did this for various, uh, various values of the, of the metallicity. And the result for the one to zero CO transition is that alpha CO of Z is equal to three times Z to the minus 0.8. So, so if you remember, sun was using 1.8, we're using 0.8. So uh, this is considerably uh, less steep. So now we have to ask the question, what is, what, what is the metallicity as a function of galactic radius for the Milky Way? Um, we would really like uh, abundances from H2 regions rather than stars because we want to average over the last, uh, those average over the last five to 10 million years, which is close to the current time, which is when we're trying to assess uh, the molecular cloud mass. But we need to cover a wide range of galactocentric radius. In particular, we need to know what's going on in the inner galaxy. Well, if anybody here has something new to tell me, I'd be very interested to know because it's certainly not my field, but we have been looking at papers by Esteban et al. on O to H. And the latest one, well, the latest two sort of hint at something interesting and the, and the last one, which is a conference proceeding, actually claims a double power law. And I'll show you the plot. Um, so these are the data points. And while they fit with a single power law, which everybody else does, uh, they note that, well, it doesn't really look like that power law continues inside eight kiloparsec. And so they fit with a double power law, which actually shows that's the function of radius, the uh, O to H increases for a while out to about the solar uh, radius and then decreases as everyone finds in the outer galaxy. So this uh, is quite important to know what to do about this. Here are, uh, here are two different uh, ideas about what to do for the, for the metallicity versus galactocentric radius. The blue point is from a 2000 paper by de Harvang 
is more or less consistent with that single power law in the Esteban plot. But if we uh, use their double power law, which changes the slope at uh, about the solar radius, uh, it's totally different in the inner galaxy. And please note that that vertical orange line is the inner limit of observation. So everything inside that is pure extrapolation. So this is gonna make quite a large difference to our results. And so I'm, I, I'm appealing to anybody who knows about abundance measurements to, to provide any uh, input that you have about this topic. So let's try uh, these various things. We have now, uh, we have a different idea about how the, uh, the abundance, the, the alpha CO depends on Z. We have the Gong et al model and we have uh, two models of, uh, of how Z depends on R. And uh, if I just use the Gong et al, uh, CO conversion factor as a function of Z, using the Esteban double power law, I get my star formation rate, or the predicted star formation rate down to 26 solar masses per year. If I use the de Harvang, which has a much larger uh, metallicities in the inner galaxy, therefore much lower masses, uh, I get the star formation rate theoretically down to five, which is starting to look much closer to what we observe. If on the other hand, I just use the Kim efficiency for free fall time, I leave, the, I leave the, uh, the, the CO conversion factor constant, I can get the star formation rate theoretically down to 2.4. If I use both Gong with the, the Harvang Z and Kim, I get the star formation rate down to 1.5. Now remember our target is the observed star formation rate is 1.9 plus or minus 0.5. So those last two are right in the ballpark. The CO conversion helps, but a key feature is the low efficiency for unbound clouds. So all this is a lot of numbers. So let me give you a more visual representation. This is the star formation rate on the y-axis on a log plot and, and various models. The first model is the extremely simple one we started with where we just take all the molecular clouds and let them collapse. Model two is we require that they be bound, and that already makes a big improvement. Um, and the next model is that uh, we account for the, the metallicity using the uh, double power law, and that helps. And the fourth model is when we leave the metallicity alone, we don't, we don't count for metallicity, but we account for the free fall time as a function of the virial parameter, and that gets you down to the upper the one sigma uncertainty on the observed value, which is the top orange line. The middle orange line is obviously the, the uh, best observed value. And the bottom orange line is the one sigma below that. And if we use both the uh, CO conversion factor and the efficiency for free fall, we get at the bottom limit. So those two will get us in the ballpark of being correct. Now we can, Broaden this by saying, look, both of these have some parameters. The efficiency for free fall time has a parameter that's multiplying the square root of the variable parameter, that B on the y-axis. The CO conversion factor has a parameter, which is how does that factor depend on Z? So we can call that A, and it's, it's the, on the, the x-axis. And if we color code the ratio of the theoretical to observational star formation rate, the, the zone between the red and the blue is where you want to be. And you can see that the Kim and the Gong models will put you in that zone, but there's a range. You can tune these parameters in various ways to get a reasonable answer. Uh, the Padawan dependence is a little too weak to get you into the ballpark that you want. So have we solved the problem? Well, a few caveats. Depends on the Miville de Chen definitions of clouds and size. Uh, a complete survey of the Milky Way in 13CO, which remember is closer to that bound unbound division would be a really nice test. And, and there's some efforts that are underway to, to do something like that. We have the issues of how does the metallicity depend on the galactocentric radius. Um, and then there's, a, Let's come back to this issue that we're doing this very simple thing to get the variable parameter. <clears throat> it's 
we're, we're picking out a region in a complex ISM using a particular tracer. We're ignoring external pressure, which would be tend to help gravity. We're also ignoring tidal effects and magnetic fields, which would have the opposite effect. Um, <clears throat> Now it all have considered the effects of tidal structures, that is a nearby ISM will tend to tidally shear a, a, a structure. Uh, uh, Kim and all considered the magnetic field and both of those argue that these clouds are probably, or these structures are probably less bound than the simple estimate. So, so they would, we would be overestimating the boundedness if you like by using this simple variable parameter. Uh, you, you can make arguments in either direction here. And there, there are other things that we haven't talked about. <clears throat> so it's intrinsically difficult to really know the virial parameter. And then uh, uh, I'm very interested to know if other theorists will agree on how the uh, free fall efficiency depends on the virial parameter or perhaps on other things. Maybe it depends separately on the surface density. Uh, so I'm hoping that <clears throat> I'm talking to various theoretical groups and hoping that they will, will produce some predictions that, that we can test against the, the observations. Well, that's the Milky Way. What about other galaxies? So uh, if, we, if we're getting it roughly right for the Milky Way, can we get it right for other galaxies? So I've already used a couple of times this uh, data from Sun et al, which is from the Fangs Alpha, Fangs Alma survey. Uh, and it's a, it's a pretty amazing survey. They have more than 100,000 sight lines towards 70 galaxies. Now, because these are other galaxies, the resolution is 150 parsecs. They do have a 90 parsec resolution for 35 galaxies. And, and note that this is J equals two to one, not one to zero. So it's effective density is a little higher. So can we use this to get the total star formation rate of galaxies right? So first, let's look at the range of metallicity in this survey. Uh, they're, they're centered close to solar metallicity, but there's, there's a range, so that can be interesting. Uh, as I said, they use the alpha CO uh, of that. And now we, we think that's a, not quite that steep. Um, they don't really have metallicity measurements for every radius of every galaxy. So what they do, they assume a mass metallicity relation, that is for a given mass of galaxy has a certain metallicity, and then they assume a certain relationship for how that metallicity depends on galactocentric radius. This is commonly done <laughs> in the extra galactic community. Their tables don't tell us what that Z is, but we can reverse engineer it because they give the luminosity and the mass. We can figure out what Z they used and then use the gong model for the two to one line. So that's what we did. And so here's all the galaxies with 150 parsec resolution. So we're, we're looking at the total star formation rate in that galaxy. And we're looking at the ratio of what we would predict compared to what's observed and, and plot the log of that on the, X, on, on the Y axis. And so zero is where you wanna be, that would be agreement. Again, the magenta is the median and orange is the mean and standard deviation of that distribution. So, and on the right, there's a histogram of the, that ratio. So it's the log of the ratio of the theoretical star formation rate to the observed star formation rate. So you want it to be zero. Well, we're, it's not bad in the mean and the median, but there's a very big dispersion. And I think you can see there's some kind of correlation there that the theory tends to over predict star formation in galaxies with high star formation and under predict star formation in galaxies with low star formation. That's particularly bad for galaxies with low star formation rates. This is also essentially a, a problem for low mass galaxies. So this is plotted now the same on the y-axis, but now plotted versus the mass of the galaxy. You can see that the, the real uh, outliers there at the lower part of the plot are, are low mass galaxies. So there are things going on that probably are beyond the, the conversion of CO gas into, into stars that may have to do with the mass of the galaxy. So those were 150 parsec resolution. What happens if we use the better resolution of 90 parsec, which has fewer galaxies? Well, once again, the mean and median are pretty good. 
and the standard deviation is a little bit better, but there's still some trend for problems, particularly at low star formation rates. And you can see that we, we miss badly for some galaxies. Well, these are pixels. Everything so far has just been, what they did was, was put everything at a constant linear size, 150 parsecs or 90 parsecs. And they just give the luminosity of CO and the surface density of the molecular mass in each pixel. Well, these are likely to be beam diluted. They're, these pixels are not necessarily centered on clouds. So you might expect that they're gonna give a lower predicted star formation rate than, than they should if we really center it up on clouds. So we were quite excited to see a paper by Eric Rozolowski et al, in which they use his methods to uh, identify clouds. Now, again, I would just I would call these structures, but, but they'll call them clouds. So they identified about uh, 5,700 clouds in the 10 nearest galaxies. They only did the 10 nearest galaxies because the other ones, the, the resolution is just too poor. So we did the same analysis for this cloud catalog and it was a complete disaster. So remember that the y-axis would like to be zero if we're getting things right, and it's up at 1.25. So on average, the, we predict a star formation rate that's 18 times the observed rate. So we're back to the kind of problems we have in the Milky Way. Um, uh, and it doesn't matter whether you're using mean or median. There, there's clearly, clearly something uh, that didn't work here. So this... Uh, this propagated a, an interesting uh, conversation with Eric and, and, and Sun about um, what they did. Uh, what, we, what we realized is that when we looked at the, these different catalogs, the mass distribution is about the same, but the sizes in the cloud catalog are all smaller. So if the mass is the same and the size is smaller, let's look at how the star formation rate that we predict depends on size, so keep, keep mass fixed. Well, from the one over free fall time, you get an R to the minus 1.5. From the efficiency per free fall time, you get an exponential dependence on R to the minus a half. So if you take the same mass and put it on a smaller size, you get this shorter free fall time, smaller VO parameter. So smaller, so a higher efficiency for free fall and the star formation rate is higher. So we asked, well, what were these sizes based on? And they were based on an elliptical Gaussian fit after this seeded watershed method that they used to separate clouds. So uh, Rozolowski very kindly supplied us the watershed areas, which were not in the paper, and we could get sizes from those. And why that's important is shown on this figure from their paper. The, uh, the blue contours here are the watershed <coughs> boundaries. So that's where they said, okay, this is how we separate one cloud from another. And the red ellipses are the ellipses that they fit to the data. So then what they did was assign all of the mass of the cloud to the, to the volume inside that ellipse. So you can see what effect that's gonna have. It's going to improve, increase the average density very substantially. So since they gave us the, the watershed areas, we use those instead to see what that would do. And the answer is it's much more reasonable. Uh, Again, there's the same y-axis where we would like to be at zero and we're up there a little above zero, uh, but uh, the star formation rate we predict is only about one and a half times the observed star formation rate. So if we use those watershed areas, things are, are much more reasonable, uh, but is that right? I don't know. So let me go to my summary. Uh, most molecular clouds, either in our galaxy or other galaxies, uh, defined by CO, especially one to zero, but even two to one, <clears throat> are unbound. The predicted star formation rate depends very strongly on the structure identification method. Remember what I, what I just showed you, the issue of the size definition uh, for other galaxies. And remember that, uh, Rice and Miville de Chen working with the same input data produce quite different results for the fraction that are bound in the Milky Way. So until we understand how to identify a structure to compare with the theory, 
uh, we have a problem. So I think what this means is that simulators and modelers have to go all the way to simulating what this, the emission and various tracers is from their, their simulated clouds, predict what we should see and say, what is the contour of some observable that you should use to make a reasonable comparison to our model? So that, that will add some, some burden to the theorists, but I think in the end, that's the only way we're going to really understand what's going on. If we use the most complete catalog for the Milky Way, that's the Mobile de Chen uh, catalog, uh, accounts for all of the CO emission, uh, and the theory for the epsilon free free from Kim et al., we can get agreement with observations of the star formation rate for the Milky Way. Uh, as I just showed you, the extension to other galaxies, we'll just say it needs further analysis. We're, we're not quite sure what's going on there. So that, that's what I have to say today. I'd be happy to uh, take any questions and comments. Thank you so much, Neil. Let's see some hands for questions. Okay, we already have one. Roberto, go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, just a quick question. I, I think I missed how you measure the observational star formation rate in all these plots of the catalogs of clouds. Uh, I'm sorry if you mentioned it and I missed it. Can you? Okay. So, yeah. so the star formation, we, we're not doing it cloud by cloud, the star formation rate. We're trying to match the star formation rate of the entire galaxy. So for the Milky Way, that's based on this Chomyak and Povich paper, uh, which used a lot of different techniques. For the other galaxies, we just take what Sun et al. used. And I, I don't actually know what they, there's just a table that they had for the properties of these galaxies. It's probably, um, it's probably based on um, H alpha observations, but I, I don't know for sure what they used. Thanks. Thanks, Roberto. Uh, Enrique, go ahead. Hi, Neil. <clears throat> so thanks for this, uh, you know, extremely complete overview and uh, tour de force on all, the, on all this work. Uh, it's, uh, I think you have done a, a great work of putting a lot of ideas together. Um, of course, you and I have been discussing this issue for a long time, <laughs> and you know more or less my my thinking. First of all, I should say, I, I could not agree more on a few things like your second bullet here, that uh, clouds are a very, a, a very elusive um, entity. You know? And in particular with what you said towards the beginning, that they're not objects. They, they, in, one of my students has been doing some studies of clouds, comparing the following in a Lagrangian way, following the mass compared to what you find defining boundaries. And they're two completely different sets of objects. So uh, <laughs> that we completely agree with. What's interesting though, is that I found two uh, ingredients that we think are crucial uh, missing from, from your talk. And one of them is uh, feedback. Uh -huh. uh, so, because, after, uh, and the other one is the time dimension. Of course, observationally, you cannot address that, but simulations can. Uh, and so, the way uh, the way I would phrase my my concerns about this is that uh, feedback must be doing something because after all, it's okay to say the clouds are unbound. But then, what the I would push the question one step be, behind, beyond, and ask why are they unbound? Because we know that the the gas, the cold dense gas, is very prone to being gravitationally unstable. Uh, so why are they unbound? And probably uh, feedback has a, a very important uh, role in, in making them unbound. And then the question be becomes one of an av time average point of view in which you look at this whole ensemble of clouds and you look at a fraction of the material that is unbound and the fraction that is bound. Or you can take the look, uh, the, the point of view of looking at the evolution of a single cloud and see when is it going through bound stages and when does it become unbound? And so, uh, um, so I, I think that would be the, 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 the question I would be asking. So why are they unbound? What is the mechanism unbinding them? Uh, in our picture, it, it, 
it's a time issue. Uh, first, they are bound. They are want to contract. Stars go off. They disrupt the cloud and they unbind uh, uh, most of the material. Then it goes out, travels, and recollects somewhere else and repeats the cycle. And in every cycle, there is a small fraction of, of gas that gets turned into stars. So I wonder if you if you have any ideas on this temporal dimension and the role on, of feedback. Yeah, as you, as you said, the, the theorists can explore the temporal dimension and the observers really cannot. We have an mm -hmm. ensemble of clouds at different stages of, <laughs> of the process. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, uh, feedback is, uh, of course, in these simulations that we're comparing to. Uh, mm -hmm. What, what, uh, what Ostriker and Kim and others have found is that no matter how much feedback they put in to a gravitationally bound cloud, they cannot get the efficiency for star formation, efficiency for freefall time low enough. Only when they put in, they start with an unbound cloud, do they get a small enough efficiency for freefall time. So I'm very interested to see if what other simulators find, mm -hmm. uh, in particular, I'd be interested in, in comparing with your group's work. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so in that situation, I would say, where is, the, where, we, we, where is the feedback happening? It's certainly happening as you form stars that tend to destroy the cloud, uh, but it doesn't seem to be enough. And uh, another problem with that is when we look at nearby low mass clouds that are not forming any massive stars at all, so they have much less uh, feedback, they, they also have very low efficiency for free fall time. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Padawan has the point of view that the feedback operates primarily at the larger scales. The supernova remnants stir up the interstellar medium, and that's what prevents most of the gas from being bound. So you start off with the gas that's unbound. Some fraction of it becomes bound and forms stars. So I think the key thing that, that we need to understand theoretically is, is that at what point is the feedback most effective? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, here I, I, I should just say that uh, several of us have uh, strong concerns about uh, Padua simulations, but we can discuss that uh, separately. Yeah, oh, totally understand. I'm not. I'm not arguing those simulations are right. I'm saying that, that, yeah. that this, mm -hmm. this, the the role of uh, mm -hmm. the supernovae in stirring up the interstellar medium, I think, is on large scales. I think is very important. For example, that that point that we found that the Outer galaxy clouds are less lower surface density, but more likely to be bound. Mm -hmm. Inner galaxy clouds, higher, star from, higher, higher surface density, but less likely to be bound. That's because the stirring up is much higher in the inner galaxy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that sort of suggests to me that it's, it's the velocity dispersion that's really the most important thing. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thanks, Enrique. Uh, Javier? Hi, Neil. Uh, very nice and interesting talk. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so um, more than a question, I have a couple of, of comments. Uh, one of them is, well, uh, we have a, a couple of papers, one of them in 2018, in which you can compute the virial parameter for things that are not uh, round and that are inhomogeneous, and then you can be biased towards larger uh, alpha B parameters. So that's that that's a, something that observations will necessarily skew towards uh, bigger uh, real parameters. The other one is that we have um, already analyzed simulations by by Rowan Smith, which, by the way, when they put the supernova outside the the, the clouds, they not they cannot prevent. The, the, the clouds to, to collapse and to, to form very dense things. They have to put them inside such that then you can blow up the, the, the whole cloud. So in that sense, I will uh, tend to think that that probably Paduan is overestimating the, the, the influence of, of supernova because he's putting uh, uh, supernovas randomly. But anyway, in this, in this other paper, we analyzed uh, Rowan simulations and we found out that if you consider also not only the real parameter due to the set gravity, but also to the spiral arms, so, so the, the, the potential well of the galaxy, then again, for all those clouds that are close to the, to the spiral arm, they, they can be even more bound. So it's another way to, to, to 
be skewed towards uh, in observations towards larger uh, real parameters. So just just to point out that uh, this other paper is still uh, under revision in monthly notices. I hope it, it comes out soon. Very very interesting. I, I think the key question I would focus on is what what can can, can you uh, can you with your simulations deliver uh, something about the efficiency for free fall time that depends on observables that we can test? Um, yeah, yeah, if we are thinking on 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 trying to 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 give a clue for for our service in that sense. Yeah, that's a that would be very that would be very yeah, interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Javier. Uh, we have time for one more question. Anyone has one? If if not, I can I can make another comment. <laughs> uh, okay, go for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, my my audio is on, although my video is off, but uh, so. Yeah, just to complete uh, this, uh, Neil, actually in our simulations with feedback, uh, we actually do recover efficiencies per free fall time totally comparable to observations. That, that's something that that's uh, something we're still working on, but we have preliminary results in which uh, our cycle uh, cycling clouds uh, on average uh, maintain a, a, an efficiency per free fall time totally on the order of a few percent. So, uh, and this is because of the combined. So the, the other part is that when we think of objects collapsing on a free fall time, we tend to think of it happening uh, just on that free fall time, but we don't, uh, we normally forget that the collapse is extremely non-homologous. And so you have uh, activity beginning, uh, star formation activity spreading over some time. And then the, the key issue is that whether the, the first ongoing star formation events can disrupt the next, the other clouds. And, and finally, just the problem with Padawan simulations is that he puts his, his supernovae in a closed box, which is only a couple of hundred parsecs per, on, on per side. And so in my mind, those super simulations are like a pressure cooker where you cannot get rid of the excess energy driving a galactic fountain or anything. So it just stays there. And, and so it just becomes like a pressure cooker. I, I've challenged him to, uh, to report the pressure uh, in, in those simulations uh, as a function of time to see whether it's anything comparable to, to the actual ISM. Okay, but, so I, I just want to respond to your comment with one point you don't need to get two percent you need to get about half a percent if all uh, clouds are bound so uh, uh, to get to get agreement if all clouds are bound you need to get down to half a percent for the efficiency for free fall okay mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. so but I, I bet that if you if you consider things with different uh initial variable parameters mm -hmm. you'll probably get some dependence on variable parameter and that would and, and maybe other things and that would be what would be really interesting yeah, but we can make that comparison. We cannot make a comparison with what happens as a function of time. We can't mm -hmm. measure the magnetic field. We can't talk. We can't do anything about external pressure. What we get is size, mass, and velocity dispersion. That that's what observers have to work with. Right. Yeah. So in that sense, it becomes a matter of seeing of averaging over time right. to see what we get. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks, Enrique. Uh, Susanna, did you have a question by any chance? No, it's just that I, no, I want to say thank you to Neil and I, I'm unable to turn on my video because the host doesn't allow me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you know, I, I, I enjoyed very much from this very start my video now it's here. Very, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's a very old problem and I think that now you have a solution, it's very nice. <laughs> oh, maybe we have a solution. But yeah, well, there's lots of caveats, and so I think there's a lot, of, a lot of work to be done. So, but it's certainly it's an old problem, as you know. It's I guess as you said, <laughs> goes back to when I was a graduate student. So as I as I reach the age of seventy five, I think it's time that we should try to solve this problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, one last question from Javier. 
Yeah, I, I hope it's it's short, Neil. Uh, so you were commenting uh, or mentioning this uh, paper by Cesar Esteban, uh, in which they the, the, the metallicity kind of decreases. Uh, is there a reason for that? I mean, I thought it, it was always rising all the way through the through the center of the galaxy. So why and and actually why exactly at eight kiloparsecs? No, it shouldn't be like a a, a, a selection effect or something. Yeah, I, this is not my field at all. I mean, I, I read the paper and they don't, have a, they don't have a particular argument. They're just saying, here's the observations and here's what it looks like. But they, they do say something about the effect of the bar. Uh, and, and that's as much as I can say, because it's totally outside my area of expertise. That's why I'm appealing to any abundance experts to, to give mm -hmm. us some insight on this. Has this been a discussion in, in extragalactic galaxies, in other in external galaxies? Or? I, I think that the assumption every external galaxy is that the, the uh, metallicity decreases away from the center of the galaxy. But I, I don't know whether that's how much of that's based on actual observations. Again, it's just not, not my field, so. Okay, yeah. thank you. It's very interesting though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, let us thank Neil again. Thanks, thank, thank you. Thanks, for inviting Neil. Me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Neil. Bye-bye. Good to see Bye. you. Bye-bye.